YouTubes, I'm Clementine Old Boy, and in this video we're going to take an old tape recorder and a DAW of your choice, and I'm going to show you how to recreate some old school studio tape effects techniques, such as tape compression, phasing, artificial double tracking, slap echo, real manual tape flanging. We'll even emulate some multi-repeat tape delay. tape delay. Some of this will be done on a guitar track, some of this will be done on a drum track. And not only will I show you how to do these, we'll use some cartoons and animations and simple diagrams to show you when and why these things were done, how they were done, and a little bit of science behind how they work. And as a bonus, I'll show you an old school technique that you can use on a drum track to take any song up to 88 miles per hour and send it back to 1985. 85. If this sounds like something you're interested in, stay tuned! Let's record a dry guitar track to use for demonstration. Now that we have that recorded, let's send it to an auxiliary output on the audio interface. Let's stick one end of a cable into that output and stick the other end of the cable into the input on the tape player. We'll zero the tape counter and press record. And now we play the track and when it's done, we'll press stop, rewind back to zero and see what we've captured on the tape. Okay, that works. So now we're gonna switch gears and change this cable to the output and the other end goes into an input on the audio interface and we'll set a level. We'll send that input to another track, rewind back to zero, press record in the DAW and choose a source. Now press play on the tape player. So now the sound has been captured from the tape back to the computer. You may have noticed how much louder and bolder it sounded. But if you look at the actual waveform on the track, it's smaller than the original, meaning it's really quieter. So let's talk a little bit about why that is. In a perfect world, the sound would have recorded and played back identical to the original. And since we hit that tape pretty hard, it would actually be a bigger waveform. But due to the reality of an audio tape not being really much more than a strip of plastic with some rust stuck to it, it can only hold a certain amount of magnetic force until it becomes oversaturated. When it reaches positive saturation, it squashes down the top of the waves, and when it reaches the negative saturation, it squashes up the bottom of the waves. And you're left with this situation where the quieter sounds are louder, and the louder sounds have been made quieter. And even though the actual sound is overall quieter, you will perceive it to be louder, bolder, and closer. And this is tape compression. Although this proves to be very useful in recording, it's less of an actual purposeful effect and more of a function of the shortcomings of audio tape as a recording medium. There are several ways that recording engineers in the past have taken advantage of the shortcomings of audio tape. The first one I'm going to show you is sidechain compression. The first thing we want to do is line these two tracks up to start at exactly the same time. Then we'll remove this tape noise from the beginning of the compressed track. If you look here, you can actually see the tape compression. If you notice, the peaks have been taken down and the lower sounds are more thicker and dense. And since this causes you to perceive the compressed track as louder, we will need to take the level down so the two tracks can blend together. And this results in a thicker, fuller sound. Okay, that certainly had a fuller and fatter sound, but did you pick up on the kind of swirling sound that was in there, the motion? Well, that is called phasing. And this is another awesome thing that's caused by the imperfections of audio tape. This time it's caused by the tape machine. During recording and playback, the speed kind of goes up and down. This is called wow and flutter. And this causes the sound to kind of be 
crushed together in some places and spread out in others. As a result of this, some of the sound is in phase and some of the sound is out of phase. I can now use these same two tracks to show you several more different ways that audio engineers in the past have taken great advantage of the inherent shortcomings of the tape recording machine. Let's take a look at the reel-to-reel -reel recording machine. The record and playback heads on these machines are actually two separate units. And this means that when the machine is running, Running and you record a sound, it takes a certain amount of time for the sound to come back out of the machine. This takes away your ability to record and monitor simultaneously. I'm sure a lot of people would see this as a disadvantage, but one day at Abbey Road Studio, a person that you might recognize had been overdubbing vocal tracks for three solid hours. He had gotten quite angry and made a comment to one of the engineers. Look man, I just don't bloody fucking understand why I have to record every vocal track two times. I can't imagine why. I can't be done with some type of machinery, or have I just gone insane? Well, the engineer, having a degree in mathematics, figures I can take three tape machines, run one line directly from the playback head to the record head of the other, and run another line from the playback head to the record head of another, and from that playback head back to the record head, and with a playback speed of X and a coefficient of distance between the record and playhead of Y one and a half inches, I can get a delay of 120 milliseconds. And this was the birth of ADT, or artificial double tracking. And to recreate this, all we've got to do is simply move the bottom track over 120 milliseconds. <laughs> Somebody out there just said, wait a minute, I can just do this by doubling the track and moving one over. Well, it's not going to sound the same. Not without the compression from the tape and the wow and flutter. As it turns out, this wasn't actually the first time that this distance between the heads had been taken advantage of. The earlier tape machines were much slower, and due to this it would take almost half a second for the sound to get from the record head to the playhead. This had been taken advantage of to great effect in the early 50s by a guy born in the same town as the godfather of the blues, W.C. Handy, and coincidentally myself. This man took two identical tape machines and placed a microphone in front of each, ran the one microphone directly into the other, and ran the other microphone through one machine into the other. This man happened to be named Sam Phillips, and placed between these microphones was a young man from Memphis, Tennessee. And all you have to do to emulate this is just move that bottom track over a little further. Well, it turns out Sam Phillips wasn't the first person to do this. This was done even before the invention of magnetic recording. Let's say they needed an echo for a radio show. Well, they would hook a microphone up to the telephone and have the operator patch them from New York to California and then back to New York. The sound would rip through all those miles of wire at the speed of light and come out delayed on the other end. There was even a guy who was able to get a much longer delays before Sam Phillips did that. You may have heard of Les Paul. Yeah, that guy. He did all kinds of crazy stuff with tape recorder, including adding extra heads, inventing multi-track recording. But we'll talk about how he put a speed controller to the tape recorder. Now you can make yourself sound like a chipmunk or a demon, but you can also slow the tape machine down and get as long a delay as you want. Well, what if you want more than one delay, multiple repeats? One way to do this is to loop the tape. This is how early delay machines like the Echoplex work, or the Space Echo, which had a box full of loose tape. But pretty early on, Jamaican reggae producers started taking the signal from the playhead, putting it through a mixer, and then running it back into the record head. Now the sound is being recorded again simultaneously as it's playing. This is how you create that yak, 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 yak Jamaican snare sound. Depending on how high your mixer fader is, is uh, how many repeats you will get. You can even make the delay get louder and louder. And if you simultaneously increase the speed while doing this, that's where you get that vocal effect like blah, 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 blah. And for an even more spaced out sound, you can run that loop through a spring reverb unit. To emulate this, we'll move that compressed track way over. 
Then I'll rewind the tape to zero and record it back in at a lower volume. And the reason I've done this instead of duplicating the track is because I have a different set of wow and flutter. Now we saturate that new track with reverb and we get an effect like this. This next effect can also be attributed to Les Paul. It has to do with perverting that wow and flutter effect to your own advantage. They would exaggerate this effect by rubbing their hands on the edge of the tape reels, or flange. This is called flanging. Now I'll show you how this can be done on a normal tape recorder. Okay, so that didn't sound so special, right? But the magic happens when you play the two tracks together. Pretty awesome, huh? Tape flanging is my favorite type effect. But if I take the reverb off of this extra repeat track and use it with the tape delay, you'll see that you get that hairspray powered mullet ballad of the 80s sound where you expect some guy to sing like this, yeah. In those old Aquanet Drench power ballads, there'd usually be a part where the guy would go, Guitar! Drums! So let's do that. Now drum tracks love tape compression, so we'll crank the output level up real high and hit this tape machine as hard as we can without causing damage. And with the magnetic saturation thing we talked about earlier, you put a wave in it like this big and it will just cut the top and bottom right off of it. Of course it's exaggerated in this diagram, but it works like a limiter, a distortion, a bit crusher and compressor all at once. Kind of harsh, but it has a good effect when used in a side chain. And then with a normal amount of tape compression, it's kind of thin sounding. But somehow it makes the drums fatter. You might have noticed it also put a little bit of phasing in there. Okay, now time for the bonus drum technique that was actually discovered completely by accident. Okay, it's 1980. Genesis is in the studio. Phil Collins is behind the drums recording drum fills. Wait a minute, he looks just like Sam Battle from Look Mom No Computer. I wonder if Sam's name is actually Sam Collins. Illuminati confirmed. <laughs> They've got the mics all close to the drums to get that good dry drum sound. But the mixing board is new and they're not used to it yet. So the engineer actually forgets to cut off the intercom that they used to talk back and forth from the control room to the studio. Well the intercom is picking up all the reverberations from the room. And it's got a noise gate on it to keep it from hissing in your headphones when nobody's talking. When they listen to the playback the drums is like boof, doof, boof. And Peter Gabriel and Phil Collins are like holy sheep fucker. 
Dude, that sounded bloody fucking awesome! One year later. I can feel it coming in the air tonight. Oh Lord. And that's the story of the birth of Gated Reverb. The reason why the Simmons electric drum kit sounds like farts in a tunnel. Alright guys, to recreate this, we're basically gonna strip the drums down to just kick and snare, record that onto a tape, record it back to the computer, then you wanna pick out the absolutely cheesiest, shittiest reverb you have, turn it up pretty dang high, then put a healthy amount of gating on there. Now when you blend this back in with a full mix of the drums, you get pour some sugar on me Yamaha 80s keyboard drums. Now we're going to mix everything we've done previously together and I want you to pay attention to how the tape noise doesn't seem to matter in the full mix and the whole thing has a vibe of spring break class of 86. Wait a minute, is 80s retro? I was born in the 80s. Does that mean I'm old? I still don't grow no chest hair. I can't even buy a beer without ID. Well, that just about does it for this video. I hope you've been inspired to recreate some tape effects, or at least you know now where all your VSTs and stomp boxes came from. If you found this entertaining, maybe give it a like and subscribe. Till next time!